Good morning, you guys. How's everybody doing today? You guys doing okay at this side? Okay, how about over here? The middle? Oh, the middle. Whoa. Hey, being at church is supposed to be fun, right? I'm really glad to, to be here, you guys. Um, I'm glad to be talking about what I'm going to be talking about today, because we're going to be talking about Jesus. And um, if you guys were here last week, you know we started a series we call The Divine, and we kind of jumped into a story that is really an eyewitness account that was written by a guy who knew this man named Jesus, and Jesus changed his life. And what this guy wanted to do was write down all the things that he saw Jesus say and do, and he wanted to kind of help us see Jesus uh, a little more clearly. And I think that, that at the Bible, there's a lot of things that we could learn from the Bible, and we certainly can. But one of the best things that we can do is spend time studying and learning about Jesus. Because what happens when we begin to learn more about Jesus, what happens is that we begin to see Jesus a little bit less of the, you know, two-dimensional caricature that we oftentimes go through life thinking Jesus is. And we begin to see him fleshed out a little bit more, and we see him more like a, a real, alive, flesh and blood human being, which he was. The Bible says Jesus was fully God, but he was fully man, and he, that he experienced many of the same emotions and the same things that we go through, the same temptations that we go through. And so the more we get to know Jesus, some things begin to happen to us right? Um, first of all, we begin to believe more. John says the reason he wrote this book called the book of John is be, so that we could believe that Jesus was actually God and that by believing we would have life in his name. And so it should make us believe in him more. It should make us, it, we should be changed when we learn more about Jesus. We should become more like him the more that we learn about him and the things that made him tick, the things that he did, why he did the things that he did. And as Christians, we should, that should be the main goal of our lives, right? To become more and more like Jesus. And then finally, I think as we get to know Jesus more, it should make us be more in awe. It should make us be more in wonder. It should make us worship this man, Jesus that the Bible describes as being not only a man, but being the Son of God, the creator of the world, the Word made flesh. And so that's my hope for us today. My prayer for us today is that we would get to know Jesus a little bit better and that we would, you know, be changed, that we would be in awe. In fact, let's, let's pray right now that that's what would happen to us. Father God, I pray that as we see your Son a little more clearly today, Father, that you would change us, that we would become more like him, that we would be in awe, and that we would, as John puts it, that we would believe, and that by believing that we would have life in his name. I pray that that's what happens to us today, and I pray all this in your great name. Amen. Amen. Well, look, let me just do a quick, uh, we'll move through this really fast because I want to take us from where we were last week until where we are actually going to be this week. So last week, Pastor Mark talked about the very first miracle that we know of that Jesus performed, which was he went to a wedding and he turned this river water into the best wine that these people had ever tasted. You guys remember that? After that, John describes some other things that Jesus does. He starts healing people. He, does, he heals a couple of note, noteworthy people. And Jesus begins to get this crowd around him. This crowd begins to gather around him because they want to see what he's going to do next. And because many of them want to be healed themselves. Now, he also gets noticed by the religious leaders of the day who are really the people who are in charge of their society, the Pharisees. But the Pharisees do not like Jesus. They don't like what they see at all because, number one, they're jealous because the people are starting to follow Jesus and not them. Number two, they don't like some of the things Jesus is doing. Jesus has done stuff like healing people and doing good works on the Sabbath, which the Pharisees believe is breaking the law, so they don't like that. And number three, Jesus is beginning to say things that, and, and claim to do things that only God can do, like forgive sins. And in fact, Jesus is beginning to claim that he is, in fact, God, and the Pharisees do not like that. To them, that is blasphemy. And the Pharisees are thinking of different ways that they can get rid of this troublemaker named Jesus. Well, as soon after John describes, Jesus gets word that his cousin, another guy named John, also known as the Baptist, has been arrested. He's been executed, his head chopped off by King Herod. 
And it's at that moment that Jesus decides he needs to get away from the crowd. He needs to get away from ministry, possibly to grieve, possibly to recharge his batteries. But he gets in a boat and he gets in this boat and crosses the Sea of Galilee to go with his disciples to a remote place, the Bible says. He just wants to get away to be with a few of his uh, small group of friends and to be with his father. But the people that have been following Jesus, they don't go along with the program at all. They figure out where Jesus is going and they follow him like paparazzi, you know, over to this remote place where he is. And in fact, the crowd is even bigger right now than it was before. In fact, John says that about 5,000 men show up and with the women and children, it's probably a crowd of about 15,000 or so people. And they have come to see Jesus do more miracles. The disciples don't like the fact that these people are there. In fact, they tell Jesus, let us get rid of them. They don't like it because Jesus wants to be alone and all these people are there, but they also don't like it for another reason because they say, these people are going to get hungry and then they're going to get hangry and we're out in the middle of nowhere and we don't have enough money. We couldn't possibly buy enough food for all these people, which I, I empathize with the disciples. I do. I mean, as as a father of four kids, one boy and three girls who has paid for three weddings, I know how expensive it is to feed a lot of people. In fact, um, just just as being the, the dad of a fairly large family, it's me and Tracy and our four kids and their four spouses and their eight kids so far. So when we're all together, there's 18 of us so far. And me being, you know, a good dad, I like to pick up the tab, you know, when I can, when the kids let me, which they let me a lot. (laughs) And um, in fact, I don't know how many of you have ever had this experience. Raise your hand. Okay. uh, Raise your hand if you have ever, or am I the only person, if you've ever spent $157.73 in an Arby's (laughs) drive-thru? Anyone? Has anyone in this room ever been to Arby's? <laughs> okay, okay, the Norco people, I see. You, you Eastvale snobs, <laughs> you, you've never been to Arby's. Jeez, what's wrong with you people? <sighs> the horsey sauce? I mean, come on, that's good stuff. Okay, so I understand, I empathize with the disciples, okay? But, but, but Jesus says, no, guys, the disciples say, send them away, we can't feed them. And Jesus says, hey, do we have any food? Five loaves, two small fish. You've heard this story. One of the greatest miracles that Jesus ever performs. It's not the story we're going to talk about, but it happens right before the story we're going to talk about. So I want to give you some context. And and Jesus says, give me the loaves and the fish. And he takes those and he he blesses them and he breaks them open. And he says, give them out to the people. And over the course of I don't know how many hours, the disciples feed 15,000 people with five loaves and two small fish. It is the greatest miracle, one of the greatest miracles that Jesus ever performs. It's the only only miracle besides the resurrection that's recorded in all four gospels. So it's a very important one. What what happens is the disciples see this and they go, oh my goodness, what kind of man is this who literally creates food right on the spot and feeds 15,000 people with five loaves and two small fish. And, and this is where we pick up our story because the people also, in John chapter 6, verse 14, it says the people, when they saw the sign that he had done, they said, this really is the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus knew that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain to be by himself. See, Jesus didn't come this time around to be made king. Jesus came this time around to give his life as a ransom for many, to seek and to save those who needed saving, to pay for the sins of the world, to die for your sins and for my sins and for the sins of the entire world. So Jesus is not going to let this crowd get in the way of what he knows that he has come to do. So he tells the crowd, hey guys, appreciate it a lot, but you need to go home. I need to go up in the mountain to pray by myself. And this is what brings us to the story that we're actually going to talk about today in John chapter 6. We continue on in John chapter 6, verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into a boat, started across the sea to Capernaum. Darkness had already set in, but Jesus had not yet come to them. Then a high wind arose, and the sea began, the sea began to churn. 
After they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. He was coming near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him on board. And at once, the boat was at the shore where they were heading. So we're on the Sea of Galilee, okay? Um, Sea of Galilee is actually a freshwater lake. It's there today. If you would go to Israel, you would see it. Um, it is about 14 miles long. It's about seven miles wide. It's about uh, two-thirds the size of Lake Tahoe, for those of you who know that lake. So um, it, it, it is a sea that's very important in that region. Um, we find it in a lot of the stories that Jesus and his disciples are involved in. There are strong winds that come through that area. Today, if you were to go there, you might encounter this. And it literally whips up these huge waves. And you can have these huge storms on this freshwater lake. Partially because it's so shallow and partially because the wind gets so strong. Um, people have seen waves of, of, of over 10 feet. Okay, so that's the type of thing we're talking about. And we find the disciples on a boat, in a boat, on the sea, rowing for their lives. And they're about halfway across the sea. And they're in the middle of this big old storm. Now, John doesn't tell us why the disciples. You might have thought, okay, wait a minute. Jesus and his disciples are together. And then Jesus goes up on the mountain and the disciples go into the boat. Why are the disciples in the boat? Well, John doesn't tell us. But Matthew and Mark, who write about this same exact story, they give us a few more details of this story. And in Matthew and Mark, we find out something pretty interesting. We find out that Jesus himself was the one who told them to get into the boat. Isn't that interesting? Jesus tells the disciples, in fact, Mark, I think, says he put them in the boat and told them to go and he will meet them later. So let me get this right. Jesus, the Son of God, the divine, the one who knows what's going to happen, puts them in a boat, puts them on a sea where he knows this storm is going to come and he knows that he's putting them in danger. He knows he's putting them in a very difficult situation. He knows that he's putting them in a very scary situation. And so why does Jesus do that? You ever ask yourself that same question? If you're a follower of Jesus and you're trying to follow him and you're trying to do what it is that he wants you to do, have you ever asked yourself, why is it that sometimes when I'm following Jesus, those seem to be some of the times that I'm in the worst storms of my life? And you might be asking yourself, why do I have to go through storms when I'm following Jesus? But isn't this true? That sometimes the storms that you have in your life are unavoidable. I mean, sometimes they're avoidable, right? Some of the storms are our own cause, you know? We're the reason for that storm. But many, I would almost say probably most of the storms that you or I might come in contact with as we're living our lives, they aren't really our fault. They're things that happen to us. And sometimes those storms are unavoidable because it's Jesus himself that actually puts us right into the middle of that storm. And you might wonder, why would he do that? If Jesus loves me, why would he put me into the middle of a storm? You might be asking yourself that question right here as you sit here today. I know some of you are. You know why he does it? Because Jesus knows something that you and I may have learned in our lives, but we might not know it yet, but we're going to find out soon. And that's this right here, that some storms are necessary because nothing strengthens us more than going through storms. And I wish it wasn't true. I wish that we could be as strong. I wish we could be the type of people that God wants us to be, the type of people who are amazing people without going through hard things. But we just know this. It is not possible. We all know what a survivor is and we want to be like a survivor. We, we, we want the character and we want the strength that people who have survived something have. But we don't necessarily want to have to survive anything to get there. But that's not the way life works. Even, even James, when, when James, what does he say? He says, consider it pure joy, brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because you know that it's only through those trials that the testing of your faith is what develops perseverance. You know, a, a Navy SEAL does not become a Navy SEAL by laying around on the beach and sipping Mai Tais. Right? He only becomes a Navy SEAL, he or she only becomes a Navy SEAL because they go through hell 
They go through the hardest thing. They go through physical and mental and emotional, almost torture and pain. And then when they get through all of that, then they are able to be called Navy SEALs. Nothing makes us stronger than going through storms. Now, most of us, when we get in a storm, I'm guilty of this, we spend most of our time thinking, how can I get out of this storm? But maybe what we should be asking is, what can I get out of this storm? How can I get out of the storm? Where, where's my, where my nearest exit route? When what we could be asking is, okay, what could I be getting out of the storm? Because there's some things that we only learn in storms. There's some things we only learn through failure and through hard things. You know, NASA said that they learned more in the near tragedy and in the failures of Apollo 13 than they ever would have learned had they actually landed safely and successfully on the moon. There's certain things we only learn in storms. And yes, Jesus does love you. And yes, Jesus does want what's best for you. But he loves you so much that what he doesn't want for you is just to have a carefree life that leads you nowhere. But instead, what he wants for you is an abundant life, an eternal life. And he knows that there's times that the only way to get you there is by putting you in the boat and by telling you, hey, go across the sea and I'll meet you. And there's sometimes that he puts you directly in a storm because he knows that that's what you need. So the disciples are, are in the time of their life right now. They are, they, they are tough guys. These guys are fishermen. These guys are sailors. These guys know what it's like to work on that sea, okay? So these guys are tough guys. So when the Bible says that they were scared, you got to know they were in the midst of something. Um, Matthew says that it was about 3 a.m. when Jesus finally gets there. And so you got to figure this. He puts them in the boat about dark, maybe a little before dark. They start going across. It should take, I've read, it should take about, um, about two hours to row hard across the Sea of Galilee. Here they are. It's 3 a.m., which means they've probably been rowing for 10 hours or so. They've rowed all night through this fierce storm with these huge waves, their lives in danger. They got to be exhausted. They got to be tired. They got to be wondering what in the world is going on. Why did Jesus tell us to get on this place? And by the way, where is he? Where is Jesus? You ever ask that question? I do. Especially, like, I know people who have told me, you know, I just started going to church. I just received Christ. I just started going to church. And then it it, it seems like all hell broke loose in my life. You know, you thought, well, I'm going to church. I'm going to try to do what he wants. And I'm going to try to serve. I'm going to try to give. You know, all these things. And it seems like the storm whips up. And you're like, "I, I don't get it. I thought that, you know, following Jesus, it would bring good things into my life. And yet now I'm in this storm and I'm just wondering, where is he? I'll tell you where Jesus is in this story. He's up on the mountain praying. But what is so interesting, you don't get this from reading this, but if you were to go to Israel, now I've, I've never been there. I want to go really bad. But people who have gone there have told me that if you go to the place where Jesus most likely fed the 5,000 and then you go up into the mountain where Jesus is most likely sitting here and praying, what you notice is you can see the Sea of Galilee right there. And so Jesus is sitting there praying, and it's very, very likely, in fact, Mark tells us that he sees the disciples struggling. So what we know is that he's actually sitting there, and he's watching them the whole time. And see, the disciples are going, where is Jesus? And the disciples are like, we can't see Jesus, so he probably can't see us. It's like a little kid, you know, when you play peekaboo with them, and it's like if they close their eyes, all of a sudden they think you can't see them you know? And that's kind of what the disciples are probably feeling like. That may be what you are feeling like right now. Well, I can't see Jesus. But just because you can't see Jesus doesn't mean he can't see you. Jesus is sitting up there. He's watching. He's praying. He's probably praying for them. 
He sees them. Just because Jesus, you can't see him, does not mean that he can't see you. Just because you don't feel him next to you does not mean that he's not next to you. And I don't know, maybe you're going through the storm like the disciples are, and maybe you're just about to give up. You're just about to stop rowing. You're just about to go, I can't do this anymore. Maybe to turn around and try to go the other, another way. I don't know. I wonder if that's where the disciples are because all of a sudden around three in the morning, verse 25 says, he came toward them walking on the sea. Now I find this fascinating because Jesus really could have come to the disciples at any time, right? He could have come down, you know, as soon as he saw the storm start, he could have said, hey, hey, Father, just a second, I got to go down and save my friends out of the storm. And he would have done that if that was his goal, to get them out of the storm quickly. But apparently that isn't his goal. And he waits all night long. And I'm sure the disciples thought, where are you, Jesus? You put us here and now our lives are in danger. Where are you? And see, if, if Jesus' goal for the disciples is, is their relief, then he's late. But if his goal is their resilience, isn't he right on time? If his goal is for their comfort, then he's late. But if his goal is for their character, then he's right on time. If his goal is for their tranquility, I had to find a word that started with T. <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> I'm not that good at that, but and then he's late. But if his goal is for their trust, for them to grow in trust, then he's right on time. Have you ever been in a storm and you thought, Jesus, you are late. Man, I, I have been praying and I've been asking for relief from this. I've been asking for you to fix this problem, for you to, to get me out of this mess. And you just haven't shown up for me. You're late. Maybe, maybe he's not late. Maybe his idea of what on time is is just different from yours. And maybe it's because he knows something that you don't know. Maybe it's because he knows that there's something on the other side that's worth going through the storm for. You don't know. You don't, you don't, you don't know what's on the other side. You just know you're in a storm. Maybe he knows you ever ask this question? Maybe, what if there's something on the other side that is worth going through the storm for? You know, I, and maybe many of you are like me, I tend to go like this. If I'm trying to follow Jesus and do what he wants me to do, and then the storms hit, which they invariably do, and I'm going through it, I tend to think, to question a lot, like, Jesus, is this, is this really not you? Am I mistaken? Did, did, did you not want me to go here? Are you not in this? Are you not for me? Are you not on my side? And then I start looking around for maybe other ways that I can get out of the mess that I seem to be in. And I wonder if, I wonder if sometimes we, we abandon what God has asked us to do because we're going through the midst of a storm and we just turn around and go the other way because we're like, well, obviously it, the storm means God's not in this. When it might be that what it means, the size of the waves and the si strength of the wind may actually mean that this is so hard because what is over there is so good that we couldn't possibly be ready for it, that we wouldn't be the type of people who could handle it, that we wouldn't be humble enough, that we wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't have enough perseverance, we wouldn't be strong enough to handle what he had for us on the other side. Many of you know my kids, uh, not only Jay and Tiff, um, who have, have left to, to plant a church in um, Redlands called Portrait, but Two other families of, of my kids have gone with them, my son and, and my daughter and, and, and their families as well. What you have probably heard, you've probably heard some uh, rumblings of some stuff that has happened to them since the day they decided to leave this church and to start another church. They've, they've seen storms. And not just Jay and Tiff, but the other families as well. Physical storms. You've, you may have heard of some of the going into the hospital and back out of the hospital and back into the hospital and stuff, but you probably haven't heard it all. You may have heard of some of the financial things, but you haven't heard it all. You may have heard of some of the spiritual warfare and the mental battles and the emotional stress that they have gone through, but every single one of those families has gone through that. And, 
I know that many of them, because I've talked with them, they're my kids, and I've talked with them, and many of them have questioned, they've all questioned, is this really from God, or is this something that we shouldn't be doing? It, this seems too hard. Maybe, maybe, maybe we were wrong. Maybe God's not in this. But what I also know, what I've also seen them ask is, but what if this is so hard because that is so good. And so the question for them has just been, will I trust him or will I let the fear overwhelm me? The disciples, Matthew 14, 26, when they saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they cried. I don't know. I, see, if I was Jesus, I probably would have walked up and been like, Ooh, maybe that's what, I doubt it. That's just stupid things I do to my kids. <laughs> but they thought he's a ghost and they're like terrified. And they cry out in fear, but immediately Jesus speaks to them. Have courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter asked, answered him, command me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Now, I love this part of the story for a couple of reasons. One, because John does not mention this in his story. John does not mention Peter getting out of the boat. And I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I kind of feel like John has a little bit of a rivalry with Peter. You know why I say that? Because, because when John is describing when Jesus raises from the dead, and you remember this, when John describes how Peter and himself run to the tomb, what does John say? John says, I'm faster than Peter. I beat him there. Right? Totally unnecessary, but John puts that in the story. And here, it's like John was writing the story, and he's like, okay, when he gets to the part of Peter getting out of the boat and walking in the water, he's like, okay, do I put the part in about how I sat in the boat wetting my pants, and Peter jumped out? Nah, nah, I don't, I don't think that's really germane to the main point here. And so he doesn't include it, but Matthew includes this in his story. And what happens is Peter says, Lord, if it's you, I can't see you super clearly, but if it's you, just command me to come and I'll come. I love, I love Jesus' response. Jesus just says, come. This is what I've learned in my life. Often, the deepest messages, the deepest truths that, that God gives me are so simple. The deepest truths that God wants us to follow are often the simplest. Come, go, give, love, forgive, believe. Not a lot of explanation necessary. Oh, we love to make it super complicated, you know? Like, okay, Jesus, do I, do I put my, my foot out on, on the water and then climb over? And then and do I have to balance myself? And, and how, 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 how so long, you know, Jesus says, come. I would go where you want me to go, Jesus. I would, but I really need you to help me see how it all works out for me in the end. And Jesus just says, no, nah, just go. I'll take care of you. I would give, I would tithe, but I really need a sign from you so that I can know that my finances are gonna be okay. And Jesus says, you know what? The sign that I want you to do this is the command to do it. Because really, I wouldn't ask you to do it if I didn't know that you could do it. I had to learn this the hard way. Man, when I, you know, I was, I never in a million years thought I'd be a pastor. It still, it still boggles my mind sometimes. And I, I remember when, when God was calling me into ministry. I, some of you know this, some of you don't. I, I was called to be a worship leader. I, I started leading worship. And I struggled so much of the early time of my life. Uh, in, in ministry because I felt inadequate, which I was. And I felt not good enough, which I'm not. And I used to pray all the time, God, if you want me to do this, you should make me better. You should give me a better voice. You should make me a better leader. You should make me more creative. And then if you give me all those things, then I will be a worship leader for you. And I always, 
I always challenge God, why didn't you make me, why, why don't I sing better? Why didn't you make me this? Why didn't you make me that when you asked me to be this? And it took me many, many years of God telling me, listen, dude, if I didn't want you to do it, really, I wouldn't have asked you to do it. Of course you're not good enough. I never asked you to be. Of course you can't do this on your own strength. You're going to do it in mine. And it took many years. And finally, I just remember one time that God just really broke through my thick, stubborn head. And he said, Tom, if you weren't the man that I wanted to do this, I wouldn't have asked you. And so my prayer began to become not, God, would you please, if, if you want me to do this, would you please make me a better singer or make me better? But my prayer just became, became, God, if this is you, command me to come. And he said, come. And immediately, Peter gets out of the boat and he just starts walking on the water. And it's crazy Matthew says, climbing out of the boat, he started walking on the water. He came to Jesus, but when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reaches out his hand, catches hold of him, pulls him up. And then he says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, I don't think Jesus is really getting hammering Peter for this. I mean, come on, let's face it. Peter's the only one who got out of the boat. You know, I don't think Peter, like Pastor Mark talked about last week, you know, having enough belief to get into the wheelbarrow to go across Niagara Falls. Peter did. He just jumped out. I think Jesus was more like, you know, probably like gave him a little noogie. Oh, Peter. Peter, you were so close, buddy. Why did you doubt? Come on, man. We were both walking on the freaking water. It was amazing. Why did you doubt? So what happens to Peter apparently is, is as he's walking, all of a sudden he's got his eyes on Jesus and all of a sudden this, probably this wave just came and boom, and like knocked him. And he was like, oh my gosh, wait, what's going on? And then he sees the next wave coming and then maybe he just started getting like looking at the other things rather than looking where he was looking at Jesus and he began to doubt and he began to focus more on the things that were coming at him rather than on Jesus. And it's at that moment that he begins to just sink like a rock. Maybe you've been there. I know I have. Where you think you're following Jesus, you're pretty sure, and you're going and you're going. Your eyes are fixed on him. You're thinking, I'm doing pretty good. This is good, man. Life's pretty good. Jesus must be pretty happy with me. And then boom, something hits you. And you're like, oh my gosh, what was that? And then boom, something else hits you. And all of a sudden, you go from this place where life is good to where bad thing after bad thing are happening. You're being tested. You're being, you know, you, you, were, you were giving. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, the car exploded and you need new tires and your roof started leaking and you're like, okay, I can't do this anymore. And it's like Jesus just comes up to me and goes, oh, Tom, you were so close. Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Here's the good news. Here's the good news. If you're in the midst of a storm like that, the good news is this, that your ability to survive the storm isn't as much about your great faith as it is about his great grace. I mean, it takes faith to, to walk the Christian life. There's no doubt about that. But your ability to survive the storm isn't so much about you and your great faith as it is about him and his great grace. And if you're in the middle of a storm right now and you're sinking like a rock and you feel like, I don't know if I'm going to survive this. Man, you, you need to do exactly what Peter did, what I've done sometimes in my life, and that is when I'm going down, just the only place that you can find hope is just to cry out, Lord, save me. And you know what the Bible says? Every time you call out to the name of the Lord to save you, he will save you. He is mighty to save, the Bible says. It doesn't mean You'll get taken out of the storm right away. But what it means is that you have a God who loves you, a God who wants the best for you, a God who promises to save you when you call on his name. 
And it's this promise that led Paul to write in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. He said, therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly, we're wasting away. But inwardly, inside, we are being renewed day by day. How many know that outwardly we are wasting away? I'm 55, going on 56. Man, I'm nothing like the incredible physical specimen I used to be. But inwardly, man, even as we're wasting away inwardly, we can be being renewed day by day. How, how is that true? For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far, far outweighs them all. Paul went through horrific things, maybe more than you and I ever will, but some of you have gone through really bad things too. And to call them light and momentary just seems so callous. But here's what Paul is saying. What we're going through, no matter how bad it is, When you compare it to the eternal glory that waits us, they are light and they're momentary. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, the things, the waves, the storm, it's temporary. But what is unseen, Jesus, is eternal. Today, I just hope that as you see Jesus, this man who walked on water, who fed 5,000 people, 10, 15,000 people with five loaves and two fish, that you would see him more clearly for who he is and that you would understand that sometimes the storm you're in is a storm that he's placed you in, but he's guiding you through, that he wants to be there for you. He's just waiting for you call on his name. He knows what's on the other side of that storm. He knows what's good for you. And I just know that as somebody who's been through storms like that and seeing so many of you in this room who have been and who are going through storms like that, I just think we should worship him. That's what happened when when Jesus got into the boat. John says immediately they were on the other side. Just like that. Three miles. They just went boop. And Matthew says that they, those in the boat said, truly, this is the Son of God, and they worshiped him. That's what we should do today in light of who Jesus is. Let's give him our worship. Father God, I thank you, love you so much for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you for the things that he's done in our lives, and thank you for what you've done through him in my life. And I even thank you for the storms that I've been through, Lord, that have been hard. But I know that you've used those storms to change me and to make me more into the man that you want me to be. I've got so far to go. But I thank you for the storms I've been through. And I thank you, even though I don't want them, but I thank you for the storms that you have that I haven't gone through yet. I pray that they would change me. They would make me into something so much more valuable in eternity. I love you a lot. And we just want to worship you. Worship your son, Jesus Christ, for who he is. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, would you guys worship our Lord?